Hello, I'm Adrian Davey and welcome to this video from Pure Electrical Training. In part one of this video series, I will guide you through the process of verifying the supply of a radial circuit, such as a lighting circuit, using R1 plus R2. I'll also show you how to confirm the accuracy of the measurements and discuss some fundamental fault binding techniques, because ultimately, that's the purpose of your testing. Moving on to part two, we'll dive into incorporating switches in a lighting circuit. We'll explore how this ensures functional switching and polarity, and I'll explain where to document the results on an electrical certificate. In part three, we'll apply the same principles to a radial socket circuit, as well as touch on basic fault finding methods before moving on to fault finding of ring final circuits. By the end of this lesson, you must know what R1 and R2 represent, and where to measure them in each supply within the radial circuit. You should know how to check and verify your measured resistance values using the IET on-site guide in Appendix I. And some of you could be able to use this knowledge to fault find a loss of continuity or a high resistance fault on a radial circuit. Before we contemplate accessing life parts, we must always take into account our legal obligations under the Electricity at Work Regulations 1989 and the importance of safe isolation. This responsibility extends not only to our own safety, but also to safeguarding others who may be working on or near the electrical installation. You can find a link in the corner of the screen that will direct you to my safe isolation video. And in that video, I also delve into the concepts of upstream and downstream within the circuit, which are relevant to the content discussed here. Throughout my inspection testing series, we will be utilizing an on-site guide currently published by the IET, and if you aspire to be a knowledgeable and a credible electrician, I highly recommend acquiring a copy if you haven't already. In this video, we are specifically interested in Appendix I and Table I1, which give us the resistance of copper per meter. Let's begin with a basic lighting set. We install these lights at specific distances, 5 meters, 19 meters, and 35 meters. The purpose behind this is to verify the accuracy of our measured R1 plus R2 values by referencing the on-site guide table I1. If we were to wire that circuit, we'd have a permanent line, neutral nerve, connecting to the first line. This light would be supplied from the upstream source. It's crucial to grasp the concept when installing testing and troubleshooting electrical circuits, because when we extend the wiring to the next light, we are working downstream from the supply. When we connect the second light, it will receive its supply from the upstream source, and this pattern continues throughout the circuit, supply feeding out to the next light downstream and feeding into that light from upstream. The exception is the last point in the circuit where we only have a feed in, indicating that this is a radial circuit, as a ring circuit would connect back to the source on the loop. For clarity, as we only need the line and CPC or circuit detector conductor for R1 and R2 testing, I'll remove the neutrals from the diagram. We are left with the line conductor, referred to as R1, and the circuit protective conductor as R2, as defined by VS7671. In this video, you'll notice that I'm measuring the resistance from the source, the supply, into the circuit. The reason for always measuring from the supply into the circuit is to validate and confirm the resistance from the point where the electricity enters the circuit to the furthest point of the circuit that it is adequately low to enable the overcurrent protective device to function as intended. And as the overcurrent protective device is at the source, that is where we need to measure from. If you haven't seen this already, I recommend watching my video on perspective fault current, the maximum ZS, and why the circuit's resistance is of paramount importance. For the low resistance tests, we'll be using test method one, which allows us to measure and confirm both the R1 and R2 conductors simultaneously. It's like getting two tests for the price of one. We connect them together at a connector block at the supply end of the circuit, and then when we test between the line and CPC at any point in that circuit, we establish a closed loop, which verifies that segment of the circuit. Since we'll be conducting tests at each light point, we'll create three loops. Here, here, and here. If you haven't seen them already, I highly recommend watching my videos on how the low-ohm resistance tester works. How to test continuity protective conductors, testing ring final circuits end-to-end, -end, and the ring final circuit figure of eight explained. These will greatly enhance your understanding of this video. 
fault finding and the inspection testing process as a whole. When you truly graph inspection and testing, you also comprehend fault finding, as dead testing is a process of identifying potential faults within an electrical installation before you switch it on. You can access my inspection and testing playlist with a link in the corner of the screen. Once we connect the low ohm continuity meter into the circuit, the MFT bridges the line in CPC, creating a closed loop. This allows electron flow from the MFT's batteries starting at the negative terminal. The electrons travel around this small circuit we've created and return back to the meter through the positive terminal and into the battery. The meter then measures the electron flow passing through the MFT and uses Ohm's law to calculate a resistance of 0.15 ohm, displaying it on the screen. Since there are no other connections between R1 and R2, there can be no electron flow further into the circuit. Therefore, we are only measuring this small closed loop upstream of the first pendant. A small loop should produce a small resistance. To confirm the readings displayed by the meter and ensure their consistency with the expected values, we can refer to Appendix I of the on-site guide. This section provides resistance values for R1 plus R2 in milliohms per meter. If you're working with twin and earth cables featuring a 1.5 mm squared line conductor and a 1 mm squared CPC, our combined R1 plus R2 resistance amounts to 30.2 milliohms per meter. Converting from milliohms to ohms is a simple matter of dividing by a thousand, making 30.20 milliohms equal to 0.03 ohms. If we consider the five meter distance mentioned in the previous slide, our calculated reading rounds down to approximately 0.15 ohms. The IET's Guidance Note 3 is another book I recommend purchasing if you are involved in inspecting and testing electrical installations. Since we might obtain a value higher on our MFT than the calculated value, it offers the following guidance. The inspector should consider potential higher measured values as a result from resistances at the termination within the circuit, contact resistance on the test probes from the MFT, and the presence of switches, fuses, and other elements within the circuit that are not part of the cable. Since the value we measured our MFT closely matches or is similar to what we calculated, we can conclude that our circuit is well connected at this point and utilizes the appropriate cable size. During your testing process, it's good to document the measured values. This allows you to pinpoint the location of the highest reading but when added to the ZE, we we'll prove whether our earth fault path will operate the overcurrent protective device within the required time or not. This becomes especially crucial when filling out an electrical certificate or conducting fault finding tasks such as an ERCR or during the AM2. As we progress through this video series, we will systematically input all these values into a dedicated table. Next, we move downstream into the circuit, confirming the supply to each light within it. As we venture further into the circuit, the resistance will naturally rise as the size of the closed loop expands. This occurs because we're trying to push more electrons through this extended length of conductors. Think of it like running 10 meters compared to 20 meters. Each increase requires more energy to move and you will slow down the further you run. In this example, the second light is positioned 19 meters further into the circuit and our measurement indicates a proportional increase in resistance to 0.57 ohms. Once again, we can cross-check the readings displayed on the meter to ensure their consistency with the expected values by referring to Appendix I of the on-site guide. We are continuing to use twin and earth cable using a 1.5 mm squared line conductor and a 1 mm squared CPZ, resulting in the same conversion to 0.03 ohms. Now, when we consider 19 meter difference from the previous slide, our calculation gives us an estimated reading of approximately 0.57 ohm. This further validates the reading we obtained for the second light on the supply side. We can now document this reading on our results table. Finally, we arrive at the last point in the circuit where we encounter the longest loop, resulting in a reading of 1.06 ohm on our MFT. For the last distance, which is 35 meters, the calculated value is approximately 1.057 ohms, which we can round up to 1.06 ohms. 
and we've now successfully confirmed that the supply remains uninterrupted throughout the entire circuit, extending to the last point. We should now include this measured value in our results table. Before we proceed to testing and verifying the switch line to CPC, it's helpful to have a basic understanding of fault finding, because in the AM2, the continuity related faults include high resistance, which may result from various issues, such as a loose connection, which needs to be tightened, a faulty piece of equipment, or the use of a damaged or incorrectly sized cable. An open circuit occurs when a conductor has become detached and is no longer in contact with the terminal. Another issue could be a break in the cable where the cable has sustained damage. If the break goes all the way through the conductor, you'd have an open circuit. If it's a damaged conductor, you may encounter a high resistance. Misconnection arises when a conductor is connected to the wrong terminal. For example, the neutral and the earth being incorrectly wired in reverse. Such scenarios could potentially complicate the precise characterization of the fault. For instance, is the misconnection fault that I'm showing here a misconnection, a line to earth fault, or a neutral to earth fault? In a simulated example fault condition, misconnections are typically related to line or switch line conductors. So for now, consider how a misconnection could impact two-way switching in a lighting circuit or affect a pump or boiler within a heating circuit. And this can lead to situations where something is either permanently on or not switching correctly. I'm also working on another video that delves deeper into fault finding and the AM2, so stay tuned. First, let's discuss high resistance and open circuit faults, both of which can originate from a loose terminal screw. A high resistance fault yields a reading significantly higher than expected because the contact with the conductor is insufficient. If you recall, at five meters, we anticipated a reading of 0.15 ohms, but here we have 1.2 ohms. This indicates a closed loop, but the electrons cannot flow unimpeded, so we need to inspect those terminations. If the terminal screw is completely loose, causing the conductor to lose contact with the terminal or even fall out, this results in an open circuit. An open circuit is confirmed by an out of range reading on the MFT, showing a value greater than 99.9 .9 ohms. This means we either have an exceedingly high value that falls outside the range of the MFT, or we have an open circuit as demonstrated here. If a cable were damaged and the CSA or the cross-sectional area of the cable was compromised, this would impede the flow of electrons and lead to a higher reading than expected. If you drive, you will know the pain of four lanes of traffic attempting to squeeze into one lane if the other three were blocked due to an accident. In the case of a broken cable, you would encounter an open circuit, meaning there's no closed loop and the electrons are unable to flow at all. If we were to continue with the traffic analogy, the cars are all lined up ready to go bumper to bumper, but the road is incomplete and missing. So they are just sitting there waiting for the connection to be made. If you need to identify any of these faults within the circuit, you would switch from test method one, which is R1 plus R2 testing, to testing each individual conductor using test method two. Starting at the supply, you would test the feed into the first light, yielding a value of 0.8 ohms. This suggests that the fault is not in this segment of the circuit. For added confirmation for the test results, you can again refer to table I5 in the on-site guide and calculate the expected value. Upon confirmation, you can progress to the next section of the circuit and assess the feed to the next light. Here, we measure 0.25 ohms, reinforcing that the fault does not reside in this part of the circuit either. At last, we reach the final segment of the circuit, and because the circuit is broken, we lack a closed loop for electrons to travel along, resulting in an out-of-range reading of 99.9 .9 ohms displayed on our MFT. This discovery allows us to pinpoint the location of the open circuit fault between two points. If we were required to write a report on the fault to provide feedback to the person who requested the work, the report could be structured as follows. A broken circuit protective conductor has been identified between the second and third pendant. This issue allows us to classify it as an open circuit, and to rectify this, we can replace the 1.5 millimeter twin and earth cable running between second and third pendant, since the CPC is an integral part of this cable. If the circuit was wired using single core conductors, enclosed in trunking or conduit, we would simply replace the individual cores. 
In practice, it is essential to conduct thorough checks on connections and re-terminate them if required before concluding that a partial rewire is required. If it is confirmed that the cable was indeed the source of the fault, a cost analysis should be performed to compare the expense of cable replacement with the cost of locating and repairing the break within the building structure. The decision should be based on the available evidence. Once the necessary repairs have been made, it is crucial to conduct retesting to verify the success of the repairs and to ensure that the electrical system is now in compliance with safety standards. Depending on the nature of the repair, it may also be necessary to issue a minor work certificate. Both test method one and test method two are essential components of the inspection and testing process when dealing with endocrinity related faults. The same process can be applied to the line conductor when measuring the first segment leading to the light will typically encounter lower resistance compared to the CPC thanks to the larger CSA of 1.5 millimeters as opposed to one millimeter. If this segment appears to be in good condition, we can proceed to the next. Upon testing this segment, we receive a reading that is higher than our expectations, suggesting a high resistance fault. We can verify this reading by consulting Appendix I and Table I1 of the on-site guide, which confirms that we should anticipate a resistance of 0.17 ohms. As you can observe, there's a significant discrepancy of 0.69 ohms, indicating the need for further investigation, repair or replacement. If you were required to write a report on the fault to provide feedback to the person who requested to work, the report could be structured as follows. A high resistance fault has been identified between the first and second pendant on the line conductor. This issue allows us to classify it as a high resistance fault. And to rectify this, we can replace the 1.5 millimeter twin and earth cable running between the first and second pendant since the line conductor is an integral part of this cable. After completing the required repairs or replacement, it is essential to conduct retesting to confirm the success of the repair. This step is critical for both verifying continuity and resistance, and without retesting, there would be no reliable means to determine the effectiveness of the repair and a minor work certificate may be required. Hopefully, you know what R1 and R2 represent and where to measure them at each supply within a radial circuit. You should know how to check and verify your measured resistance values using the IET on-site guide and Appendix I. And some of you could be able to use this knowledge to fault find a loss of continuity or a high resistance fault on a circuit. But that concludes part one of this video where we explored the process of verifying R1 plus R2 within a radial circuit, particularly in a lighting circuit, and how to validate the results you obtain. In part two, we will delve into the intricacies of conducting and validating R1 plus R2 testing for a lighting circuit, focusing on the switched line and CPC to confirm polarity and functional switching. In part three, we'll apply the same principles to a radial socket circuit, as well as touch on basic fault finding methods before moving on to fault finding of ring final circuits. Remember, this video can contribute to your off the job training for apprenticeships or serve as part of your own CPD. Please show your support by liking, sharing and subscribing so that everyone can benefit from this valuable content. Thank you and take care.